So my first question is pretty general. How would you describe the current state of the planet? Well, it depends on what... I mean, the current state of the planet in so many ways is, seems to be dire. Um, certainly from my perspective as an anthropologist, when I realized that of the 7,000 languages spoken today, half aren't being taught to school children. And, you know, people always sort of say, well, that's just natural, it's just another form of change. And that's simply not the case. I mean, these cultures aren't somehow quaint and colorful, but destined to be fade away. You know, in every case, they're dynamic living people has been driven out of existence. And the tragedy of this is that it's happening just when we're coming to understand the real significance of the great revelations of genetics, which ironically have always been seen to be opposed to cultural uh, anthropology, but in fact they're completely complementary because the geneticists have finally proven it to be true, something that philosophers have always dreamt to be true, and that is the fact that we're all brothers and sisters. And what I mean, I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography, we're quite literally cut from the same genetic cloth. Studies of the Y chromosome and the male descent line and mitochondrial DNA in the female descent line of humanity leave no doubt whatsoever that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum, that race is an utter fiction, that we're all descended from a handful of people who walked out of Africa 65,000 years ago. And in this incredible journey of 2,500 generations, 40,000 years, we carry the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But if you accept that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, but you have to accept the obvious corollary, which is that all human cultures essentially share the same raw human genius. And whether that human genius is expressed in technological wizardry, or by contrast, invested into the unraveling of a complex thread of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the affairs of progress. The old Victorian idea that there was this evolutionary ladder to success that invariably plopped Victorian England at the apex of a pyramid that went down the sides of the so-called primitives of the world has been absolutely exposed by anthropology to be as much an artifact of the thinking of the last century, in the 19th century, as the idea that clergymen had then that the earth was only 6,000 years old. In a wonderful way, genetics has reaffirmed the, 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 the essential interconnectedness of humanity. What that really means, therefore, is that the other peoples of the world, the other cultures of the world, are most assuredly not failed attempts at being modern, let alone failed attempts at being us. They're unique answers to a fundamental question, what does it mean to be human and alive? And when they answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices. And those voices and those visions of life itself collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us in the ensuing millennia. So when you suddenly realize that half of those options, half of those possibilities are being swept away in a generation, that's a dire scenario. So why, in your, in your view, has, has, because in a way it's turned out they were right in Victorian times, because those are the ones that are, are leaving our consciousness, and this one is taking over. No, no, no. These no. people aren't leaving this world. They're being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. You know, it's not as if these cultures have somehow failed evolutionary moments. On the contrary, they're dynamic peoples being, being affected by power, you know, and that power can be egregious industrial decisions, it can be the triumph of ideology, be that Marxist, communist um, ideology coming out of Beijing, afflicting the Tibetans, or it can be the cult of modernity that we ourselves are guilty of spreading around the world. And that's an important point. These people, um, are not passive victims of history, they are victims of power. And the, that's an optimistic observation because if human beings can be the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. Well, that's what I was trying to get at, actually, is that uh, uh, from my point of view, I'm more inclined towards uh, a native uh, perspective of the world. But it seems that, that this perspective is, is, is um, overrunning the planet. And, and how would you describe, describe these forces? I mean, I mean you well, the, fun the fundamental thing is that Look, all cultures are myopic, fiercely loyal to their own interpretation of reality. You translate the name of most indigenous groups and it will say the people, the implication being that everybody else is a savage beyond the pale. The word barbarian comes from the Greek barbarous, one who babbles. If you didn't speak Greek, you didn't exist. The Aztec had the same notion. And so we d tend to think of ourselves not as a culture, or this thing called modernity, we think of it not as simply an expression of a particular worldview or a particular way of organizing economic activity. We project it around the world as if it's the inexorable wave of 
history, or indeed if it's a fo as if it's a force that exists outside of history, and it most assuredly does not. If you begin to deconstruct this, the culture that has led to this sort of tr triumph of science and technology and what, again, we label as modernity, I think you can go back, and ultimately you can go back to the Greeks, but certainly if you start with Descartes, and when, he dis in the, when we so desperately tried to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith and, of course, the tyranny of the church, uh, the Enlightenment was an extraordinary um, experimentation. It was an ex incredible breakthrough, but it had real consequences, you know, in liberating the individual from the collective. I mean, that was a sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. And in, and in, in sweeping, away, sweeping away all notions of myth, magic, and mysticism, as we did when Descartes embraced mind and matter, we also swept away the comfort that faith gave us and, and the intuitions that metaphor sometimes implies. And before you knew it, as Saul Bellow said, science had made a complete house cleaning of belief. So the only way we can possibly treat the planet the way we do is because, at least from this point of view, this world view, we don't see the planet in any way of it being alive. I mean, in fact, if you tried to suggest that the Earth was animate, that the flight of a bird had meaning, you'd be ridiculed. The idea is considered ridiculous. But for most people of, of the planet, they do believe the Earth is animate. And again, it's not that one side's right, one side's wrong. But if you do believe the Earth is animate, you're going to have a different relationship to it. A child in Canada raised to believe that a mountain is just a pile of rock is going to have a very different relationship to it than a kid raised in Peru to believe that that mountain is an Apu spirit that will direct his destiny. Now, I was raised in the forests of British Columbia to believe those forests existed to be cut. That made me different than a kid of the First Nation raised to believe that they were the abode of spirits that would have to be embraced during the Hamut's initiation, such that the wisdom of the wild could come back to the community in the potlatch. The issue isn't who's right and who's wrong. Is that for cellulose? Is it the domain of the spirit? The interesting observation is how the belief system creates a different relationship from that society to that landmark with profoundly different consequences in terms of the ecological footprint. So if you want to sort of track the, the origins of this worldview, it surely is to that moment when we deanimated the earth. Now, it's, it's humbling to recall that this worldview of ours is scarcely 300 years old, and that shallow history shouldn't suggest to us that we have all the answers to all the challenges that will confront us coming down the road. I mean, take, take, take a, for a moment an example of the civilization that would be the most diametrically opposite to the worldview of modernity that I've just described. Surely it would be the Aboriginal people of Australia. Here were a people that we know from studies of the Y chromosome were the first to walk out of Africa. In very short order, they went across the underbelly of Asia and somehow crossed the water that even then separated the islands of what are now New Guinea from northern Australia. Then they reached the most parsimonious of continents and they went walking. And over the course of thousands of years, they established perhaps 10,000 clan territories like a matrix over the entire continent. And linking all that together was a single idea. That idea was a dreaming. The dreaming wasn't a dream, it was a conception of reality itself. In not one of the 670 languages and dialects of Australia was a word for time, past, present, or future, because a dreaming was a state of perpetual reality whereby the earth at your feet both existed in the phenomenological realm, but was always waiting to be born in the realm of the dreaming. So the world both existed and was always in the process of being created. And so when the British arrived, and encountered the civilization, they were completely perplexed. They saw people that looked strange, uh, who had a very simple material technology, and what really offended the British is that the Aboriginal people had no interest in self-improvement in a material sense. There was no sense of progress. And of course, the cult of progress was everything to the 19th and 18th century European society. So in the inimitable way of, uh, of the British, they concluded the Aboriginal people weren't human at all, and they began to shoot them. And as recently as 1902, it was debated in Parliament whether Aboriginal people were human or not. Of 
course, what the British failed to understand was they were just in the presence of a devotional philosophy that was just very different from theirs, because the entire purpose of life in Australia was the antithesis of progress. It was stasis. The whole idea of life was not to improve upon anything. The goal of humanity was to do the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to maintain the world exactly as it was at the time of the first dawning. It would be as if all Western philosophical and scientific inquiry had been focused exclusively on pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it just as it was when Adam and Eve had their faithful conversation. Now again, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. Had we as a whole, as a species, followed that devotional track of the Aboriginal people of Australia, yeah, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon, and we wouldn't certainly wouldn't want, you know, we wouldn't be able to cure the cancer or whatever. But on the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to transform the biological life supports of the planet. So viewed over the long term, not over centuries, but over millennia, it's difficult to know which adaptation was in fact the more adaptive. Well, this is kind of the evidence, isn't it? What, what we're heading towards? I mean, why would we need to go to the moon if, if, if in their dreaming state they can travel the universe? And why would, would there be cancer even if, they were, if you were living in a state of, of, uh, of, of uh, self-realization? Uh, well, I think that I, mean, I, I think that cancers. I mean, I would say they didn't live, won't live long enough to develop cancers. I mean, ca cancer is a natural phenomenon. It's not a consequence just of environment. But I mean, I mean, the, the hopeful thing is, you know, I remember once when I uh, I was uh, in the forest of Borneo with a friend of mine, Asik Nialik, and um, from the Ubang River, Penan, and the. Rains had pounded the forest all day. It let up, and we we'd been hunting, and there was the head of a sandbar deer roasted in the coals. And he looked at the um, looked up, and he saw the, the moon shining through the canopy of the forest. And he asked me, kind of innocently, you know, is it true my people had been there? And I said, yeah. He said, well, what kind of canoe did they have? Mm -hmm. You know, why did they go? And is it true they just brought brought back rock and dust? And it was difficult to explain to a man who kindled fire with flint and whose entire possessions amounted to a couple of blowpipes, some monkeys, a dog, and perhaps, you know, a quiver of poison darts, a space program that had consumed the wealth of nations and indeed sent, however many men it was, you know, over a collective billion miles to the moon, or that indeed they came back just with rock and dust, 828 pounds of it altogether. And you realize when a Sikh asked that question that, that what he was really getting at is that we went to the moon not to secure wealth, but to, uh, but to put, discover a new vision of life itself. And that the seminal moment, of course, is when we went around the dark side of the moon on Christmas Eve of 1968, and for the first time in human history emerged to see not you know, a sunrise or, or, or a moonrise, but an earthrise. And that kind of that vision of, uh, of the earth um, floating in the velvet void of space, as the astronauts described it, I think instantly shifted the paradigm and it's going to be something that will be spoken about for 4,000 years. You know, that was the moment when we suddenly saw that the Earth was not this limitless horizon, but rather you know, a finite orb that could only endure our ways for so long. So how, does, how, do, how, do, how do humans sort of bridge that, uh, that, that um, where we branched off from seeking the answers internally to seeking them externally? Well, we still do seek them internally you know one of the you know when I tried to when I tried to sort of you know in, in my position as explorer and residence of the National Geographic my mission was very much to try to address this looming crisis of language loss which itself was just a reflection of the erosion of cultural diversity and we knew that the best way to do it was not through politics or polemics but through storytelling and and uh, what we tried to do is take our rather enormous audience of 250 million people a month to places around the world where the belief systems really weren't just exotic but that they exemplified this fundamental idea that different cultures have made different choices the consequences of those choices can be profound and that all of those values and all of those visions deserve a place at the council of humanity's collective wisdom and so if you talk about the internal we made a film on the Buddhist science of the mind. Why, why did we call it science? What is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is Tibetan Buddhism but 2,500 years of direct observation as to the nature of mind? 
you know, a, a Lama once said to me, Western science is a major response to minor needs. We spent all of our lifetime trying to acquire possessions that we shed at our deaths and trying to make sure that we um, don't lose our teeth or lose our hair. He said in Tibet, we spent all of our time trying to understand the nature of mind, the nature of existence. Uh, he said, your billboards in the West celebrate naked teenagers in underwear. Our billboards are prayer walls for the well-being of all sentient creatures. And indeed, you know, if you look at what the Buddha taught, it's distilled quite elegantly in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering, but not the Buddha didn't mean that all life is negation. He meant that things happened. You know, the cause of suffering was ignorance. By that, he didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of their own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the Noble Truths was simply the idea that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth of the Noble Truths was the delineation of a contemplative practice that if pursued had not only the possibility but the certainty of the transformation of the human heart. Indeed, for the Buddhists, the proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind that is the Buddhist Dharma is a serenity achieved by the practitioner, and that is enlightenment. And as a Lama once told me in Tibet, you know, we in Tibet don't actually believe you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. So what's what's the answer for humanity in your in your opinion? More information? I think the uh, you know, I don't I don't think I don't think history works in terms of answers. I don't think there's an answer for humanity. I think there's an ongoing struggle between good and evil, and I think that's one of the things that I really drew out of my Christian upbringing. If there's one sort of vestige of that Christian faith that I have is I when I say good and evil, I don't mean it in sort of the kind of stark, almost cliched way that that um, that uh, is somehow distilled in, in, in church practice. But it just seems to me that that the all of history has been a struggle between the the better angels of our nature, as Lincoln said, and the dark demons of our soul. And that struggle happens within the individual, and it certain, certainly happens within the society. And the society moves in whatever direction it does by the, the culmination of all those energies and which direction in any one more point in time that society ends up going. I mean, take the Germans, for example. I mean, who would have ever guessed at the end of the, you know, early years of the, you know, 19th century when Germany was sort of a center of culture and, and uh, liberation and, and uh, inspiration that that whole mass of humanity through forces of history could, before you know it, in three generations have given us a concentration camps at Belsen and, you know, Austria to el elsewhere, you know. So I actually don't think that history, history is like a river and what you, all you can do as an individual is do your bit and choose what side you want to be on. And that's mostly Western history that you're referring to, right? I mean, if you talk about well, Aboriginal history, uh, their I history is their end goal is enlightenment of many many cultures, well, right? No, the end goal of the Buddhists is enlightenment. You know, the end goal of the uh, that's that's a Buddhist notion. You know, it, it, you know the you know even even within even within even even within I mean, I, you know, see, see I, I don't know. As an anth as an anthropologist, what I find fascinating is that. We all have the same raw intellectual capacity, we s but we, and we all share the same adaptive imperatives. We all have to have kids, we have to find ways to educate and raise those kids to come together, create the kids in a way that's very consistent, um, deal with the, the sad um, process of aging, the inexorable separation that death implies. And within that commonality, we, we find so many ways to, to blossom, which are the multiple faces of humanity, but at the same time there is this wonderful common challenge, you know, so when I speak of good and evil, I don't really, I'm not really doing it in sort of biblical terms or, or um, 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 you know, I mean, I, I think the same traits that, that can haunt us, you know, greed, covetousness, I mean, all the, I mean, one of the fascinating things, if you take, if you take the, uh, the um, the 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 um, uh, the um, <laughs> what what are what are these 
It shows you how Christian I am. The, what, are the, what, what are you trying to think of? The, the, what the, oh, oh yeah, Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I guess I've been a little away for a while. <laughs> so, but on, but on, I mean, if you take, for example, the Ten Commandments, with the exception of a couple that are kind of unique to the Judaic Christian world, um, most societies would endorse them. I mean, I don't, can't think of any society that endorses murder or adultery, you know, or theft, because these are these are prohibitions, uh, and r in fact, rules that allow a social species to thrive. So, you know, I, I, you see, it's, it, it, to me, it's a very interesting dance between um, the commonality the humans share and the uniqueness of the belief systems that distinguish them, and that's sort of the fun part of anthropology. So, when I look out at this world, I mean, I, I, I don't. I wish I could look out at this world and see some simple answers, but I, I see just simply a current of history that's flowing on. Well, it almost seems like um, yeah. it almost seems like a, 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 with our separation from 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 nature or the yeah. natural world, it seems like uh, these kind of things happen. Like you're talking about Germany, the more intellectual you get, the more you 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 separate yourself from. Um, the natural world, for lack of a better word. Well, you know, I mean, you know, I think it's really important that that you don't romanticize, you know, pre-industrial societies. I mean, you know, to, you know, when the Inca came down in your culture, if you had rejected the rule of the emperor or the sun king, believe me, they didn't exactly, you know, treat you nicely. So I mean. No, there's no going backwards for sure, but evolution is part of our uh, part of our. our I, I I think here. I mean, in, in a nutshell, you know, when I when I when I um, when I wrote the book, the Wayfinders, the the Massey Lectures, and the, the you know the title was the Wayfinders, but the editor put or, or the publisher put a subtitle: Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in the Modern World. And I kind of had to answer that question in the book, and although throughout the book I sort of answered it implicitly in many ways. But in the end, I c my answer really came down to two words, climate change. And what I meant by that is not to suggest that we somehow go back to a pre-industrial past or that we deny any hum human culture on Earth the benefits of modernity, but rather to suggest that the very existence of these different ways of thinking uh, allow us to understand that we're not trapped on a rail, uh, on a kind of a set of rails to to, to destruction, you know, it puts a lie to those who say we cannot change, as we all know, we must change the fundamental way we live on this planet. So when I say that history is like a river, it's not just individual will that shifts the the river's current and its direction. It's also necessity, and you know, as we reach certain points of crisis, tipping points, you're going to suddenly see things changing, you know, maybe not as sm simply or smoothly as you would like, or as quickly as some of us would hope, but things will change. I, I mean, I, 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 I think I if I were to identify the one single most disturbing thing in the world today, it's the fact that as we thought we were coming toward an end of readily accessible petroleum, there was this sort of sense over the last 20, 30 years that we would have to sort of shift into a post-hydrocarbon world and that even as the challenges of climate change became more and more acute and even as concentrations of CO2 became highly disturbing in the atmosphere, and indeed if you, you know, that that somehow that would coincide with some technological shift to alternative forms of energy. But what we're seeing now with these non-conventional sources of hydrocarbon, whether it's shale extraction through fracking in the eastern United States or coal bed methane extraction in the west or in fact the, the, the oil sands of northern Alberta, what we're seeing is that human beings are 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 not going to give up until every drop of petroleum-based energy is squeezed from the earth, and this is where it becomes very disturbing. Because if you know, when we think of climate change, it, it's interesting. There's there's only there's only a couple possibilities. Either the scienti scientists in their consensus are wrong or they're right. Now, given this obvious strength of that consensus, um, 
if they're if if they're actually wrong, that should challenge everybody's faith in the very notion of modernity, which might be a good thing to do, you know, for other reasons. But given that our entire notion of modernity is based in our faith in the scientific methodology, it seems to me so strange that we could have people who have no knowledge or experience or dexterity with that methodology are now suddenly, and yet in so many ways, celebrate reflexively the triumph of modernity and present modernity as the inexorable wave of history as opposed to being just a product of a certain way of doing things. On the one hand, they're saying the modern is everything. We are the modern. You can catch, you know, better catch up with us or you'll be left behind. And now suddenly they're coming along and saying the very foundation of the cult of modernity, which is the scientific method, is somehow all wrong. Because after all, all you scientists, with all your consensus, have to be incorrect. Well, it seems, that seems ridiculous to me. And, and, and there are only a, a number of options. If the scientists are, are wrong and we do nothing, well, I suppose nothing changes particularly. If the scientists are wrong on climate change and we nevertheless mitigate for a relatively inexpensive investment in the scheme of things, I mean, people are speaking of 4% GDP to solve the problem. World War II, the United States spent 38% of GDP to defeat the Japanese and Germans. If we mitigate and there was no need to mitigate, all we end up doing is making a more technologically in integrated and a cleaner world and a safer, a safer cities for our children to live in, in terms of clean air and clean water, etc. If the scientists are right and we mitigate, there's a chance for, again, to solve a problem with a relatively modest, in the scheme of things, investment. If the scientists are right and we do nothing, and if the scientists, you know, what they say is true, then we're facing scenarios that range from the disastrous to the, to the truly cataclysmic. So it seems to me that there's sort of almost no, no bad choice except inaction. But at the same time, you know, it, it seems to me that the whole issue of climate change has just sort of become this miasma um, that is some kind of backdrop of our age, but people are no longer, are no serious way trying to engage it. And that certainly was my experience with the nation states when I was in Copenhagen. So, so it, what do you make of the Occupy movement as an anthropologist? I imagine it must be quite interesting for you that there's actually this, uh, un, this sort of organic movement. I, I think the Occupy m movement in the states makes a great deal of sense. I find it, as a Canadian, bewildering that there's an Occupy movement in Canada in the sense that the issues that people in the States are confronting is a culture that has no safety net, that has no universal health care, that has that is a two-class system of education where, where those who are affluent send their kids to private schools and those who are not affluent are forced to send their kids to public schools in many urban areas which are absolutely not worse than dreadful, that in the States, because Wall Street was able to do what it did, and because you have policies that, for example, uh, allow you to deduct your mortgage from your taxes, but you can't deduct the education of your children from your taxes, which says something about the American priority, you had this r incredible housing bubble fueled by financial shenanigans and, and, and the entire society truly suffered in the meltdown, severely. None of that happened in Canada. So I, I find the Occupy movement in Canada some kind of weird, copycat, trendy, let's be like the Americans. I, I honestly don't see any rationale for it in Canada. Except but I, that said, you know, I really don't want to comment on it because oh. I don't know anything about it. But it really, to be honest with you, I'm a drive by those tents in Calgary and Vancouver. I think it's complete ridiculous. But it's not just Canada, it's everywhere. And, I, and don't you get a sense that, I don't know if you get a sense of that. There's, there's a difference, there's a difference between, you know, there's a difference between focusing, you know, political action against a real culprit. And there's another, uh, sort of putting a hair shirt on and carrying a, like, you, you may be too young, but I remember in the 60s, you know, they, all those cartoons in the New Yorkers, you know, the w end of the world is coming. I mean, you're walking around with a hair, 
I mean, put put the energy into into making the world a better place. But that's the polarity of the world these days, is it not? Isn't that the polarity in the states? I mean, this this city is also. I mean, you're a BC guy. I mean, you know, I've been interviewing a lot of really cool BC people that are that are really. Um, yes, we've we've got it pretty good here, but you're not uh, you're not unaware that that the world is changing enough for the better. Um, um, you know what I think the worst thing that happens in British Columbia is marijuana. And I'll tell you why. I don't give a shit if someone smokes marijuana. But because we don't legalize it, and because we don't tax it, and because it's now a timber, an industry bigger than timber, according to some accounts, the worst thing about marijuana is what it does to our social contract. Because there are thousands of kids out there growing up in homes where they know their parents don't pay taxes. They, they don't have to be part of the social deal. And that, that is so corrosive to a society. And that's what creates a whole cult of this coast here where, you know, I mean, it's insane. It, it, this place has become so crazy. I mean, you, you, you have a situation where, like, you go and try to get some work done on your house. The person says a different price, whether it's cash or, thing, right? Is that not true? Yeah, there's always under the table stuff, sure. No, not always under the table. No, that's not acceptable. No, I'm saying that there there's always not, is. In see, every is, field, there is that. But no, it's it's pervasive here. It's 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 endemic here, and every person who offers you a deal for cash should be turned into the authorities. I mean, this may sound funny to you coming from me, but I really believe it because it ultimately, I mean, as an anthropologist, you you recognize when 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 culture is on the edge is when it starts to fall apart and the things that cause it to fall apart are not necessarily the things you think about you know I mean to me when I look at American American society you know it, it, you look at things like the obesity epidemic you look at the hours people are playing video games you look at the the, um, the the consequences of both mother and father having to work in terms of the nature of the family space not that I'm saying women shouldn't work what I mean is that we you know we never even we never really pay attention to what that meant when suddenly, economically, not just out of women's aspirations, but out of necessity, we created a society where for the middle class, even to be middle class, both mom and dad had to work. Well, again, that's a serious shift, you know, in terms of what happens to the kids. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't get off on this, but I, I find that, you know, I think British Columbia is really in trouble. And it's because of things that, that, that people have a culture of entitlement and they don't feel they have to be part of, and I think this is largely on the left, and then the right does its own problems. But I, I shouldn't get into this, it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. Yeah. But, but, it kind but of the marijuana thing is really a serious thing. I mean, you know, you know if, you, if you don't think you have to pay taxes, I mean, think about it. If you don't pay your taxes in British Columbia, I mean, you should be ashamed of yourself. Do you pay taxes? Yes. You bet. Okay. okay. If you don't pay taxes, you should be in jail. Or, or you should not take care of any of the benefits of the society. Go live in the bush somewhere. Well, I was going to ask but you, this kind of leads to it, civil disobedience. What do you think of civil disobedience? As an anthropologist, I mean, doesn't something have to fall apart for something to come up again? Do, do, you, think that it, do you think that something needs to fall apart or, 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 or not? Doesn't that I, where think, where I think the challenge, you know, all, there's, a, there's a long history of, of things falling apart and what comes out of the ashes is not necessarily what one had hoped for and that's generally the case in every revolution you know so uh, I think I think civil disobedience is great when there when there's um, the cause is absolutely just certainly I, I participated myself in countless demonstrations against the Vietnam War I to this day I'm proud of the fact that I did I, I don't know how you I don't know how you conduct civil disobedience against an entire civilization or world order. You know, I mean, I don't know how you sit in front of the Pentagon and wish it away. I think if you, I think you have to get inside the system and work inside the system to do your bit to shift the movement of history in the direction that you think it should go in. Is that even possible? Is it even possible for someone to penetrate that uh, that world if, if you're not already in it, or if you're not? Of course you can. If you're not, there, there's, um, no, there's no conspiracy. You know, I've never. I mean, the, the, these institutions aren't conspiracies. They're just assemblages of people with certain values who are doing muddling ahead as they're trying to do. I mean, I mean, you 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 uh, you can absolutely penetrate and and catalyze. You can't. I mean, no one. No one, I mean, take something as, as, as bureaucratic as the U.S. Pentagon. Um, nobody 
from either side of the political spectrum as defense minister or secretary of defense ever can ultimately move that beast but a, a little bit, right? But all, all of history is about those little bits that move incrementally and add up to a whole. So I, I don't, uh, I don't th think in terms of um, conspiracies. I've met, never met an American or Canadian who keep a secret, let alone a conspiracy. I mean, the, the, the scary thing is, you know, you know it would be wonderful th to think, for exa example, about the United States, that there was this kind of center of power back there that was some kind of a cabal that was sort of making these kinds of choices and cahoots with the great capitalists and financiers. And I mean, I mean, uh, it would be wonderful to believe that was there because maybe you could actually legislate against it or you could move against it politically. But the scary thing is when you get there, there's no there there. And I know this from having lived inside the heart of Washington and having married into a major political family. I mean, I, I've, I've met all of these so-called dark nights of, of your worst imaginings, you know, Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld. I mean, these are all people I used to, so, you know, I didn't socialize with, but I knew that I sat down to dinner with all of them. And you'd like to think that there's this cabal there, but the terrifying thing is when you get to the heart of it, there's no there there. There's just individuals with their values doing what they think needs to be done. I mean, if there was a real cabal on Wall Street, 2009 would not have happened, because why on earth would they have allowed that to happen? It's the problem, and the scary thing is that there, there are no conspiracies, there are no inner <laughs> cabals orchestrating history. There's just human nature, you know, unconstrained by culture and the values of culture. Well, that's so what it comes down to, isn't it? Values. Because obviously, if a, Bo if a Buddhist I mean, was running this world, it would, be, it would look like a different world. Yes, exactly. If many other cultures are running this world. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, you got some good stuff at the beginning. Yeah. I no, so. I just, I, you know, you know, I, you know I, 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 I once got ripped off here in Vancouver, you know, in a, a rental car, I lost a laptop and some original images. And we were joking about it today, you know, I spent three days with the cops, and it was like this surrealistic thing, you know. And then I started asking, could I find anyone in Vancouver who had not been personally ripped off? I couldn't. It, 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 oh, that's okay. Don't worry. Yeah, it's an epidemic. It's an epidemic, and it's all it's all because of a certain permissiveness, you know. And and the Occupy Vancouver thing is all part of the same thing. It's the same thing that allows people to grow marijuana. I mean, why don't we just have to shit or get off the pot if we're going to allow people to grow marijuana, legalize it, and tax it. You know, I, I don't think it's just the marijuana thing. I think uh, I think that everybody gets a sense that there's that something needs to change drastically in the world. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know if you get that sense where you are, but uh, I know that everybody I know feels that way. It's getting tougher. It's getting tougher to do what we do. It's getting tougher to do everything. It, uh, the food's getting less trustworthy. Mm -hmm. You can't go out in the sun. I mean, I remember when you could drink the water, and I remember when you can go out in the sun. Maybe we were deluding well, well, but, ourselves. But, but why? You know, what I find interesting in British Columbia is that is that everybody's sitting around places like Vancouver with these concerns. And no one's doing anything about what's actually happening in the province. So, for example, Occupy, uh, the Occupy movement sitting in front of the art gallery. How many of those students or kids, or whoever they are, has has taken the effort to really know how the forces of capitalism are riding rampant in this province? That's what this book I just wrote is all about. You go you, if you go to the hinterland, if you get off your ass and you travel around the country and you see what these mining companies are doing. Then, you, then you've got something to fight against because they're riding roughshod over our country while we're sitting around here talking about abstractions as you just articulated. You know, oh my God, I'm worried about the food I'm going to eat. I'm worried about the water I'm going to drink. Well, you know, you, you can't do anything about that except eat the best food you can. But if you really want to commit political action, rally around protecting the areas that are being so threatened by these very industrial forces. I mean. You know, when I say I don't believe in cabals, I don't believe in cabals, but I do believe that individuals of incredible greed are taking advantage of every moment they can to ravage our country. And those are the people that should be brought to task, and the only people that can be do that is a society at large. And if all of those kids, whoever they are, sitting around Occupy Vancouver, were actually educating themselves about what really is going on in the province, they'd be marching on specific offices of specific enterprises 
that are actually about to destroy places of incredible historic significance to all Canadians and all peoples, like the sacred headwaters. That's the stuff I want to know. But that, like, yeah, how do we affect change? Like, well, how, that's exactly what well, you well, said. Well, I mean, just we, you know, I mean, it's like it's like when I said, you know, these cultures aren't destined to fade away. They're being driven out of existence by specific forces. So when people say, what can I possibly do about it? What can I possibly do to help? And the people almost indulge themselves in their hopelessness. And what you can do is everything in, under the book. You know, pick an issue that you really care about, whatever it is. If it's carbon emissions, that's one thing. If, if, if you're concerned about the quality of your food, that's one. But then locate the person who is perpetrating the the, um, the, 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 the the actions that you think are challenging your life and confront them. You know, instead of sitting here talking about a problem we can't really control beyond our own individual actions like climate change, why not do all that, you know, and speak out about climate change, but meanwhile identify the sites in British Columbia where, you know, meadows that are the homeland to indigenous people where the salmon are born are being torn asunder to feed the very engine that you're complaining about. Don't just sit around and complain about the engine. Stop the feeding of it and get organized politically. Stand up for the sacred headwaters. March on the companies. Right now, Imperial Metals, a little company, 75th biggest mining company in British Columbia, basically a handful of men, has gotten together and secured the rights to destroy a mountain that has the highest population of stone sheep in the world. A mountain that is such a wildlife um, treasure that the government has not allowed a hunter to use a gun on it in 40 years. And yet, without hesitation, we're allowing this small group of men who have never been up there, who've never felt the pain of a long winter, or the promise of a bright spring, to transform that landscape. Just consider what it is that we do in Canada to allow a mining company to go ahead. What do you have to do to establish a mine in, in British Columbia? You cobble together a company with less history than my dog, you secure the subsurface rights to a place you've never been, the, 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 the stories of which you've never heard, the pain of a long winter you've never experienced, nor the promise of a bright spring, and as long as you can guarantee the government a flow of revenue, either in the form of taxation or royalties, you secure the right to transform by any definition that place forever. And what's fascinating is not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes the industrialization of the wild that places any value whatsoever on that land left alone or any cost to the commons, the rest of us who will not benefit from its destruction, but will pay the cost. But that's not ever factored in the economics of mining development in British Columbia. And, and that it's crazy. It's as if you're selling roses in your garden and I come over and I want to buy your roses and we have a transaction. You're happy. You sell me your roses. I buy your roses. But as I'm walking away, having taken the roses out of your land, I mentioned, by the way, I'm destroying your house. And you say, what are you talking about? That's not part of it. Oh, yes, there's collateral damage when I take the roses. Well, what are you going to pay me? Oh, I'm not, I'm not paying for the destruction of your valley. I'm just taking the coal and paying you for that service. You know, I, essentially, you deal with the valley. Well, that's what they do to us all the time. I want, I'd love there to be a rule that for every tree that was cut in tall tan country, a rose bush was cut in the garden of the wife of the executive of the company who cut the tree in tall tan country. For every drop of toxic waste that goes into a river in the hinterland, I want a, to a drop of toxic waste to go into the swimming pool at the local YMCA where that executive's son or daughter swims on Saturday mornings. You know, to the to the urban ear, that sounds ridiculous, but that's exactly what First Nations mean when they say this land is our garden. You come in here with your poisons, you're destroying my kitchen. And that's exactly what the Tall Town people are saying to Royal Dutch Shell, to Imperial Metals, to Fortune Metals, these enterprises that behind the backs of Canadian people, while our attentions are diverted to, to to pointless events like Occupy Vancouver. Meanwhile, every day these companies are moving into these valleys and destroying the heritage of those kids camped out in Occupy Vancouver that they don't even know about and not even are not engaged enough to do anything about. And that seems like a waste of energy amongst those people camped out there. And, 
and a complete kind of this um, lack of responsibility for the rest of us living in the city. You know, we need to know what's going on in our hinterland because it's being done whether you like it or not. I mean, the problem in Canada is we're the most thoroughly urban um, society, certainly of the major industrial countries of the world. We like the idea of the North, but we rarely go there. But those who do go there in response to this commodity boom know exactly what their intentions are when they go there. And the rest of us, meanwhile, are turning our backs on the future of our own country. I mean, it, it gets so contradictory and strange. I mean, I once was sitting in a lodge in the, in the Stikin where, where I noticed there was a stranger. And I was thinking about my friend who used to own the lodge, and he uh, gone through the ice in his trap line and been killed. And, and the, uh, this woman walks in, and I can tell from the way she, she's come down from the mine site, which is right by my home up there. And she's breathless. She, she says to the guy, wow, this is a conversation. Wow, did you see? Yeah. You see the sheep? Yeah. I've never seen so much wildlife in my life. How about you? No, I've never. It's the most beautiful place I've ever seen. I know. It's incredible. Ever been up here? No. Never been. No, no. Never north of Prince George. How about you? No. I've never been north of Williams Lake. Well, but yet, do you see those animals? So here they were having this breathless conversation about this mine site that it was their corporate and bureaucratic duty, because she was an engineer, he was the assistant deputy minister of mines. They were up there with the corporate and bureaucratic duty to destroy a mountain. They, they couldn't stop breathlessly you know, and effusively describing this most beautiful place they'd ever seen. And I, I remember sitting there thinking, God, maybe, just maybe, for once I'll get the irony and, 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 and recognize what they're doing and get the hell out of this country and take their terrible schemes with them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great.